Okay, we're back. We're live. We're Global Connections today with Carlos Suarez. We'll always enjoy talking to Carlos. He's in University of the Americas in Puebla, Mexico, not too far from Mexico City. And uh, he runs the International Relations Department there. And we get to ask him so many questions about how the world works in general. It's a flat world, isn't it, Carlos? Absolutely, Jay, and aloha, saludos. Uh, I'm actually in Mexico City right now, uh, sort of camping out here, uh, uh, keeping you know low low key and 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 you know staying at home, as you if you will. Uh, but it's an interesting yeah. time, of course. We continue to see this unravel. Uh, lots of information, lots of misinformation, but also important. Uh, you know, as you know, I'm a college professor here, and uh, like all universities too, we've had to suddenly close the classroom and, and bring it into the virtual online field. Uh, I've been an online in, uh, instructor for many, many years, but now my regular class has had to quickly, like so many others, switch to online. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. How do we uh, make these adjustments? And, and as well for other people having to work from home now, uh, easy to do in some areas, not so easy in others. But even beyond that, just understanding you know, the all the ins and outs of this uh, crisis as it unfolds, uh, particularly things about borders, because, uh, you know, diseases don't have passports, they don't stop. And, you know, and, and, you know, we have a world, however, where we see increasingly many world leaders are basically trying to control and, and, and limit, uh, you know, well, essentially lock down some of those borders. Uh, and so how do they do that? What are the challenges and issues involved with that? Um, you know, we'll, we'll address some of those things here today. But it's good to see you. Welcome. Okay, let Good to see you. Thank you for coming on, as always. So let's talk about, uh, you know, the school. Let's talk about, you know, every college, mm -hmm. in fact, every educational institution mm -hmm. in the world is faced with this because there's something mm -hmm. over 170 countries are involved in the, in the corona mm -hmm. crisis. And so yeah. they got to make a, you got to adapt things and you're adapting like everyone else. But how are you sure. adapting specifically? What changes yeah. have you made? What software, what equipment? Uh, and how have you communicated mm -hmm. all this to your students? Yeah, well, it came rather suddenly, although uh, we began to see it maybe about two, three weeks ago now, some of the elite schools, I think Harvard was one of the first and Georgetown and a handful of others quickly announcing that uh, with the spring breaks that occurred in most American universities a few weeks ago, that they would not be returning and that, you know, quickly the faculty would have to move to put their courses online. Now, online education, it will vary. Uh, some places do a lot of it. Some places do very little of it. But in general, in the universities, we do have a, you know, a broad experience. Uh, uh, we have a, you know, a learning management system, uh, one of the common ones that I use, for example, Blackboard, where you basically have uh, tools that allow you to put lectures, uh, you know, materials, you know, even, uh, you know, global connection shows that I that we tape here. I often share those with my classes. And uh, but uh, other than that, it, it's also a forum that allows us to, you know, to keep a conversation, a dialogue going. So we have interaction going. The students are able to continually dialogue and and uh, and you know carry out a a discussion uh, and it, you know and I, I step in there too so you know my courses they still have six seven weeks left to go and I've quickly had to switch them online uh, they were not originally online but because I have that experience relatively easy for me more challenging for professors who do not normally teach online suddenly the learning curve and, and the quick technical challenges uh, but you know we do have a, and, and I think you know, just like you talk about the health profession uh, dealing with the you know the infectious disease of, of what this involves uh, at the universities, we've got suddenly the technical support staff that are frantically trying to help faculty make this switch. Uh, and even for students who, you know, again, they didn't sign up or plan to take an online course, suddenly now they have to because there's no alternative. Uh, so there's a bit of anxiety, a uh, learning curve that goes along with that. But more importantly, I think uh, it's an opportunity, and, and I certainly am using it for my current classes to continue a discussion more in depth uh, about these, you know, the issue of uh, coronavirus uh, uh, and you know how it plays out. Now it lends itself because I'm a professor of international relations. I have a course, for example, on U.S. foreign policy, where we will look at maybe the U.S. role or or how it's uh, addressing the crisis. Uh, another course I teach is global political economy right now, and of course, you know this is having a profound impact on the on the world uh, economy. So we use it as an opportunity to, you know, continue and end up the discussion. I mean, if you're a chemistry or I don't know a physics teacher, maybe it's a little different, more challenging. Uh, but of course, a wealth of information out there that we have to sift through and and give our students a, a chance to. I think I think it gives them a chance to reflect and to you know, use this time that maybe they're at home now where they would otherwise be, you know, dusting the room or, you know, cleaning the toilets. Uh, rather, they can, they can now uh, engage and, and use it as an opportunity to take a break from, you know, what, what the, you know, homestay or, or, you know, staying at home entails and, and using it as a learning opportunity as well. 
So what, how does it work? I'm afraid I've never, you know, been involved in a, mm -hmm. in a course online like this. Uh, I understand mm -hmm. that uh, that Zoom ha ha gives you the ability mm -hmm. to break your students up into sure. groups, little groups, yes, and that's right. you can only talk mm -hmm. to the groups. And I wonder, you know, if, yeah. if I start out with the conventional model, professor talking to class, class asking mm -hmm. professor questions, professor answering mm -hmm. questions, showing stuff on the blackboard, uh, whatnot. How much different is this mm -hmm. from that? Well, you know, on a fundamental level, not much. We're simply taking those same, you know, techniques into suddenly this new online virtual reality. But here, I would say this, you know, even I've been teaching now for about 30 years, I'm getting a little up there in my middle age. But today, the way we teach is obviously changed from what we might have been doing 20, 30, 40 years ago. More and more emphasis on group projects, group dynamics. Uh, you know, we know that that's what students, students to prepare them for the real world. I mean, you work in teams, you work on, you know, bringing together, harnessing different skills and talents. So typically, uh, like I have a foreign policy class, for example, uh, the team, uh, my, my class might have, I don't know, 35, 40 students. So we break them up into small groups of three or four students where they'll be focusing on a particular issue. In my case, they, they might study a US president, you know, Kennedy or Nixon or Reagan or somebody or, or Clinton and look at their foreign policy as a small group and then they present their materials uh, and they have to deliver a presentation. Uh, the challenge is that, of course, um, well, or let me just say a few more things about the online format. It takes various forms, but I can tape lectures that they could hear, uh, like a video. Uh, I could share with them maybe a PowerPoint presentation. I could connect them to you know, YouTube videos, again, the Global Connection shows and others like that, uh, as well uh, today of all the major media and, and news outlets have you know, podcasts, or they have, uh, you know, good, uh, maybe a, just a good article that, that we can read. And it's very easy to connect all these. Uh, 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 again, I would say, because I've been doing it for some years, it's pretty straightforward. But if you're somebody who hasn't been doing that, just learning the technical issues of how yeah. you're posted to do this, that can be daunting. It's, it's not ideal to suddenly, you know, on week 12, be told now it's online and, you know, overnight. So that's a challenge. But again, uh, there are various tools, uh, you know, the discussion is another one uh, where you've got Maybe the whole class will be looking at the same materials and they have to post a little, uh, you know, comment and then they will see what others have read and they have to respond to it, extend it. Um, now, for some, it can be what we would call synchronous, where they actually go live at a certain time during class. That uh, I, I haven't been doing that much myself because uh, especially as I do some online teaching, sometimes students may be all over the world, uh, particularly the, a lot of the teaching I've been doing with, with HPU there. Um, so it's much easier for me to set up a scheme where the students come in on their time, uh, asynchronous. So you've got a set of instructions, things they will look at and have to comment on, but they do it at their own time uh, within a certain deadline. Um, other than that, I mean, you know, typical students uh, would have to be writing, you know, maybe research reports or, or submitting, you know, some essays and all of those things get uploaded. Uh, and the other thing it changes though, especially in this format is that you kind of do it at your leisure at your, well, not leisure, but at your, at a time that works for you. It could be late at night. It could be early in the morning. Uh, that gives a little more flexibility. Uh, but it is a new dynamic for many, both and the students too. Uh, and again, some institutions will have a higher percentage of that, uh, places that have a, maybe a lot of uh, non-traditional learners, adult learners often have online courses that, that reach out to people who can't do the traditional classroom setting. Uh, but other places where you have the you know the classic tr traditional classroom, suddenly going online is maybe a, a little bit out of that comfort zone. It's something you're not used to. So there are many challenges. But again, I want to say today in 2020, I mean, all the major universities have these learning uh, management systems, a platform, uh, yeah. and, and Zoom that you described is a good example where you know we integrate that as well. You can set up separate groups. The students can connect that way. Uh, and so it's set, really it's designed to give us that uh, I think uh, that flexibility that you could be anywhere anytime and 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 it, you overcome the challenge of commuting or going somewhere to meet now uh, as well as a professor of you know issues like diplomacy and negotiation the fact is you know you often you really do need to have some you know uh, uh, I guess I want to say you know, certain things uh, about how you learn about diplomacy you have to have uh, group dynamics, or, or let me see how I can phrase it. Maybe you need, you know, people to people contact, you need to talk to people because uh, in the end, there's only so much you can do at a distance. And, uh, and there's certain and things it that has to be live and synchronous. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And, you know, I, I mean, again, having live and maybe live just, uh, you know, groups, uh, and, and these other formats we've described, that can help. But in the end, it's not a complete substitute for actual 
people to people dialogue, just like negotiations. You can do a lot of it by phone or email or even even a Skype interview. But in the end, you know, you really need to meet people. Uh, and uh, right now that's on hold as we're all basically trying to, to stay away and minimize our contact. Uh, but, you know, we have to work with what we have. You know, it's interesting that, uh, that the, the um, a number of schools, uh, not, not in the first tier, but like Phoenix, for example, <coughs> University of Phoenix, has been, you know, using and developing online uh, teaching material for oh, decades and decades. Yeah. Uh, and they, they already have it in the, in the, in the bag. They have, it, they have it already working. It's interesting that sure. they have an advantage. Anyway, I wanted to ask yeah. you about tests. You know, in the conventional sense, uh, you got a blue book. Uh, do they still use that term? Um, and uh, <laughs> I think a blue don't. book is one of those one of those trivia questions that students would go, "A what? A blue book? A what?" Um, and you're referring to these, you know, these little booklets where you would you would handwrite uh, and maybe you do an exam in them. Uh, they're not quite as widespread. Uh, and even, you know, again, different norms, as you well know, I teach in different parts of the world. I mean, mostly I've been based in the U.S. for most of my career, but now in Mexico many years, I also teach regularly in Europe. And there are different norms in terms of what, you know, what kind of materials. Uh, here in Mexico, for example, it's less common for students to buy all the books that we use. In the U.S., it's pretty straightforward. Here's my class. These are the three or four or five books you must buy. Um, you can get them on Amazon or you can go to the bookstore. Here, uh, and I want to say, and especially a lot of developing countries, there's a greater tendency to just, you know, scan the books or to get copies of, you know, PDF files of it, uh, a less stringent uh, uh, intellectual property control. And that's a problem for, you know, in the first world, we, we, we have stricter, uh, uh, I guess, uh, uh, norms about, you know, using materials for educational purposes and not just, you know, giving away free materials. But I want to say there's no shortage of information. You can get, you know, particularly the access to, you know, academic journals, uh, you know, good media reports and, you know, think tanks, the kind of, again, I do international politics, so we have a, a lot of foreign policy think tanks, even as you all know, there in Hawaii, places like Pacific Forum that put out, you know, good, uh, uh, timely information. Those are easy links. You can say, here, here's a, you know, here's a quick piece on, you know, US, uh, North Korea, or whatever it might be. Uh, so there's, you know, but, but here again, uh, this is the new style of teaching. You know, when I began teaching years ago, you had a book and, and, and the students took notes and they took a test. Now it's like, Here's all the information that's out there, and and I, you know, what I generally would do, they they have to get familiar with, you know, websites for organizations, think tanks, government agencies, uh, and and there's just an information overload. But you have to, hopefully, the skills that we're helping them teach, critical thinking that's good. skills that's are. That's the real uh, world. That's that's the real yes, world. Yes. Yes. What, what about the testing itself? You know, do you do you have the ability with this? With this online training system to give them a pop quiz and get their answers and have their answers graded yeah uh, oh, and, and absolutely yeah so you can do uh, it anytime again, the, tools, the tools are in there and they can do testing and uh and you know and there's lots of in fact there's just a, a whole range of possibilities there that they can do online uh you know exams uh i tend to I, i'm not one that leans towards a lot of rote memorization i've always just shied away from that i prefer essay writing, research, you know, reports. And, uh, you know, I teach courses that are a little more maybe advanced level uh, and and the students instead need to do more of the critical thinking, uh, writing and, and researching. So uh, le less of these little quizzes. Sometimes that just becomes like busy work just to make sure they did the reading. Uh, what I will do with mine, for example, we have a weekly discussion forum where they have to look at a common set of readings or maybe some video or, or a podcast and then answer some questions in a more informal style. And this is what I call more of a, of a, of a you know, classroom dialogue, a question and answer. So they will post their little you know, brief paragraph and then they will see what another student posted and reply to that. And it creates this threaded discussion. That's a common feature. Uh, but there are, you know, again, the online format, it, it's been around now for some time, really the last 20 years, the last 10 in particular, it's been fine tuned quite a bit. So are you in this in the difficult times, these threatening, dangerous times? Um, are you are you giving them a break on grades? Are you being forgiving? Are you, are you somehow giving them giving them a, a more a more easy course than they had before? Well, uh, I, I mean, uh, this this current week, for example, is our first week where we've gone online, and uh, and for example, no grades right now. Let's just work out the kinks, get get comfortable with it. So no grades. Uh, the other, as you all know, here uh, in Mexico, uh, the home of the famous Corona beer, um, I've got my little Coronita here, um, and uh, 
<laughs> this is the you, little the virus from never from came. The virus never came from Mexico. I want to be clear about no, that. No, of course not. <laughs> However, the Corona Beer Company has had to handle their own crisis management because there are, of course, as you can imagine, conspiracy theories, misinformation that it all starts with Corona Beer. And my understanding is that their sales have plummeted in some places. Yes. Uh, uh, you know, it, it's quite sad. But uh, here I am keeping, you know, uh, the national uh, economy going. So let me make sure and, and keep things flowing okay, here. All right. Okay, good. Yeah, we're getting this on tape. <laughs> um, uh, so let's, and, let's, uh, let's move to international relations for a moment, Carlos. Um, you know, borders. The, it's like I used to say in the early days of think tech, the borders are dissolving. You know, if you could go from Germany to France, just drive down the road. There was, you couldn't even tell where the border was. And I thought that was, a, you know, an, an indi indicator of enlightenment in Europe anyway. <clears throat> and uh, I, I thought that was the trend, didn't you? Now, all of a sudden, borders are much harder. Yeah, 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 th absolutely. And what we see is, you know, around the world, many leaders have been restricting non-essential travel more and more. We were hearing these uh, these uh, pronouncements coming out. Some of them are sealing off the borders entirely to, to, to help, uh, you know, contain and curb the spread of this uh, coronavirus. Uh, and, you know, and yet at, at its core, I mean, uh, there are certain, and, and actually here's an interesting thing to look back. We, we have a long history centuries ago where uh, we began to see this use of border controls as a way of uh, basically uh, limiting the spread of disease. In other words, this is not the first time this has happened. Even looking back at the 14th century, the Black Death that uh, went through much of Europe became a justification for, for some of the very earliest border controls. Now, in the 14th, 15th century, we didn't have clearly defined borders. So maybe it was certain places where you knew, well, that side of the mountain or that side of the river. Uh, it wasn't until about the 16th century that we had atlases that began to deliberately you know, show us or delineate the borders. But one of the lessons that we draw from that early experience is that border control and lockdowns, as they've been going on for a long time, they tend to outlast whatever crisis they're supposed to prevent. So yes, you have a disease and, and, and the border comes up to you know, control that. Uh, this took place, particularly the Italians were quite big on this, whether the Venetians or the, you know, the, the Genoans, uh, and they pose a lot of different uh, examples. Italy you know, used to have patrol ships and observation posts and, and horse uh, And this went on for quite a long time, at least until the mid 19th century. Uh, but my point here is that you start this process of putting up borders and controls. And sometimes, you know, once they, issue has gone away, you, you continue to maintain that. Uh, I kind of think of it sometimes like when we create bureaucracies or institutions, it's very hard, almost impossible to make it go away. You know, it has a way of like redefining its, its reality. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, much of this is often, especially even today, a more of an expression of a xenophobic policy than any other enduring solution. Because again, uh, while yes, it may sound good to say, oh, we're gonna close that border, Interestingly, I just read some reports today up in the border of uh, Mexico with Arizona in Sonora. The state of Sonora is, is the bordering state of, uh, of Arizona. There's a group of Mexicans that have begun basically protesting at the border, not allowing Americans to come in because right now the U.S. has a much higher incident rate of, of, of infection uh, than Mexico. Mexico has been relatively low. So again, uh, these things bring out, I think, a, a lot of uh, fear and, 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 and sensationalism. But at the same time, it's, uh, you know, governments are trying to show that they're doing something, controlling that. Uh, now, of course, when it comes to like airplanes, yeah, you can see because these are, these are like a little, you know, Petri dish of, of uh, uh, bringing people very closely together and a lot of concern about that. Uh, so, uh, you know, we see it, China perhaps took the lead on this. And I can remember some 10 years ago, a trip I took there uh, before you even got off the plane, they would come on board dressed in these white outfits and put a little temperature gauge on your forehead. And if you had a fever, you had to go this way. Uh, and that, of course, China has done a lot of that in, in their early stages of this crisis. Uh, but uh, again, the borders, I mean, at the end of the day, these diseases, uh, because of the flow of people and, and movement of, of goods and, and, and transport of everything, uh, it is very, very near impossible to contain it. Now, you, nevertheless, you, you certainly can address you know, uh, the spread somewhat. And so there, there's a re reason why there's a desire for that. But I, I would maintain at the end that it's driven probably more by, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, you know, gaining some, uh, some points with your, with your popular, uh, you know, with the masses, let's well, say. You have a confluence of things here. <clears throat> number one is trade war that Trump created. Um, mm -hmm. Number two is um, 
you know, we, we have we have a decline in the economy because of coronavirus. Now, the three mm -hmm. is the borders uh, related to that is also sealed in many ways, sealed. Um, and yes. each country has its own, you know, border issues. Um, mm -hmm. And the global economy is going down. The trade war is still on. Uh, people don't know what to do about the virus. You got political xenophobic maneuvers happening. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, the, and the victim of all of this is not only the national economies involved, but the global economy. And I wonder if you could talk about that. I mean, how are all these factors, particularly the hardening of the borders, um, affecting the decline of the global economy? Well, we're, we're getting just the early indications now. I'm sure over the next few weeks, we're going to see more about the really massive decline in, in trade uh, uh, and um, and even China with its massive, you know, clamp down. Perhaps, you've, you know, we've seen uh, pictures uh, from satellite of how massive, you know, the, the on one hand, the, the, the bright side is that the pollution has been brought down dramatically, but the, the flow of merchandise and goods, it, it, and because of the interconnection, again, the interdependence of the global economy, you have these supply chain networks where a product, maybe an iPhone that's assembled in China, it has parts from Malaysia, from, you know, South Korea, from, you know, California. And when you begin to put a, you know, a, a, a slowdown on any of those uh, pieces of the, of the supply chain, it, it just, it creates a havoc on everything. So the world economy is certainly going into a pretty deep, deep crisis. Probably the worst we've seen, my guess would be since the Great Depression uh, by all measures. Uh, and uh, so it's gonna take some time uh, to overcome that um, and it won't quite be the same. Uh, you, you talked earlier, for example, about Europe and, and this idea, we, we've seen it in the last 30 years, the, the globalization of the world economy and, and, and borders they have eroded and you know and today maybe not today uh literally because we've got again more border controls but in general in europe you've got borders that have been eliminated and, and the free flow of goods and people but now suddenly a retrenchment and going back to creating more uh, look at the the crisis how it flared in, in northern italy initially uh, and that border with france on one hand with uh, maybe austria to the north suddenly they, they they've had to impose restrictions that they didn't have for, for many years. Uh, the impact is, again, it's profound uh, and, and it's psychological as well, because again, people, you know, borders suddenly became almost just like, uh, I mean, you know, again, I travel quite a bit in Europe on a regular basis and you didn't think about it. Um, uh, you just suddenly, like, it's like driving in the US and going through, you know, Oklahoma to Texas, uh, you know, you just see a sign, but there's no checkpoint. Um, and that is now suddenly, now you've got uh, borders all over the world. Like, and even, uh, I think uh, in the last day, we've seen reports that the, the U.S. and Canada have been negotiating uh, potential uh, uh, border issues and the U.S. trying to uh, argue for pulling American troops uh, along that U.S. border to help with surveillance. The Canadians have been upset saying, no, you know, we've got this long border that for years has been pretty much open and massive, massive flow of trade. Uh, but basically, the U.S. has a uh, government, the uh, Trump government has apparently been requesting uh, U.S. troops to be placed within 20 miles of the Canadian border. Again, this is a different world we're living in. And, uh, you know, the Canadian oh border, most of it, most of it is, in, is not even marked. I mean, you can go on a snowmobile and just drive, you know, uh, across without even seeing anything. Uh, but, of course, at least in the major urban areas, you know, the, the borders in the northwest and, and maybe other parts of the east, uh, we're now seeing uh, more tension about this and, and, a, and a desire to want to, you know, militarize the border. That's quite dramatic. Oh, my God. Uh, Canada, our, our, you know, our closest uh, ally to the north, uh, really, I mean, it's terrible xenophobia. But going back to Europe for a minute, so you have the EU uh, mm -hmm. and you have, uh, you know, the migrant problem into the EU. You have the UK, um, you know, shoving off from the EU. You have Trump refusing to pay the U.S. Uh, share of the, of the EU defense expense. You have Russia trying to dissolve whatever it can in Ukraine and make pipelines that bypass uh, member countries of the EU, the other ones that are just trying to divide. And, and so the EU, it seems, seems to me that by virtue of all these processes, including the fallout of the, on the coronavirus, the EU is in great jeopardy. Uh, as a as a trade group uh, and as a sort of collective economy, don't you think? Yeah, and I think what it's showing also is even you know the variation within the different countries. 
countries, the member states, uh, how they're responding to it. And, uh, you know, and, and maybe whereas we had seen over these last almost 30 years now, well, since uh, 1993, 94, when the EU was formalized, <clears throat> we've seen a gradual but steady process of, you know, eliminating borders and, a, you know, maybe at some level, a, a growing sense of a European identity, less so the national identity. This crisis is helping to, I think, bring back a resurgence of some of this nationalism. Uh, and you have some governments, maybe those that are more xenophobic, like uh, the, the leader in, in Hungary, Viktor Orban, uh, the Polish leadership right now, very anti-immigrant. Um, and so yeah. there, they, 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 this is a, a, just an additional, beyond the migrant problem that's been there for the last five years, this is just one more, uh, I guess, little wedge that's gonna allow, you know, particularly, you know, uh, populist and, and anti-immigrant leaders to, to use it as a pretext to continue to close the border. Even here in the U.S., again, I mean, we've seen recent tweets by President Trump that, you know, we need that border wall as if that's going to stop the, the virus. Um, it, but it is a, an opportunity that it is an opportunity to push, you know, policies. And, and for the President uh, Trump, it, you know, that border wall has been one of his signature, uh, I guess, promises to, to continue it and, and clearly using this crisis as a, an argument to, for further need for it. Uh, but again, the other, the end, the other thing that comes out of this, Carlos, is that is that diplomatic relations, uh, borders, and diplomatic relations are inextricably intertwined. If you go, I wish I had one too. If you go to the uh, <laughs> fortified, we go forward. Uh, if if you if you um, if you if you have a, a, a diplomatic, or rather a, a border issue, you have a diplomatic issue too. And in the yes. case of China. Somehow our relationship with them, although, you know, uh, in many ways it was superficial, our relationship now, the gloves are coming off. Uh, yeah. Trump is attacking them. They're attacking the United States. Um, they're, you know, trade is uh, under the influence of the tariffs. Um, everybody's calling each other names now. Um, so the border is hardening conceptually and really in terms of trade mm -hmm. and immigration. Um, and yes. and at, the same, at the same time, diplomatic relationships are weakening. And we, we see it clearly in the case of China. But I'm wondering if that's happening elsewhere. If the coronavirus, on top of other issues that have hardened borders, hardened relationships, um, you know, doesn't that mean we are having a global decline in the, what do you want to call it, the, 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 the courtesies and the friendship? Uh, otherwise yeah, yeah. involved with diplomatic relationships. Absolutely. No, this has heightened tensions in so many ways. And, and, you know, on one hand, you mentioned China. And actually, just today, the Chinese are now announcing that they will close their border to most foreigners starting this Saturday. Uh, they have a desire to want to, again, they, they, they've seen an increase in somehow the imported cases. And even though it appears that they have now managed to overcome maybe the, the bigger challenge there in, in this Wuhan uh, city, uh, but now they fear that you know, imported uh, 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 cases will, will continue to ravel. Uh, but it doesn't help, of course, that we have here from the U.S., uh, you know, a president who calls it the China virus or the Wuhan virus. So there's this growing, again, xenophobia, uh, anti-Chinese you know, sentiment. Uh, but let me give you an anecdote here just in the region here, Mexico, with one of its neighbors to the south from El Salvador, uh, a recent incident a few days ago where there was an airplane coming uh, basically, I believe it was uh, coming into um, El Salvador, and the, and they were refusing to allow it to land coming from Mexico because, curiously, even in this region of Latin America, there's been an interesting uh, variation in the response of different leaders. Many of the countries, particularly in South America, uh, have begun to take you know more aggressive steps to lock down and and you know promote social uh, distancing and the like. You know, Chile, Peru, Colombia, uh, Argentina. Uh, the two outliers to most of this happen to be the two largest country, Mexico and Brazil. Uh, the leaders, both of them populist, one in Mexico, uh, Lopez Obrador is a, is a populist leader from the left. Uh, the leader in Brazil, Bob Bolsonaro, is a right-wing populist, but both been criticized for taking a much more lax or lackadaisical attitude. Uh, meanwhile, there are other you know, brothers and cousins here in South America and in Central America uh, have been rather critical of that because they feel that you know they're not doing the right thing, let's say. Uh, but you have, again, heightened tensions about a lot of this, uh, even, you know, tensions that have been there for the past few years with Venezuela and Colombia, Venezuela and Brazil, uh, and uh, and a fear that if a country is not being responsible and taking care of what they need to, it's going to spill over. 
and affect others. Again, that's the the the, the nature of these kind of global issues like this. Uh, and here again, I would just tell you, you know, we, we have a lot of debates about, oh, what could we have done more? Did we know what was going to happen? The reality is that we, you know, we have known for many, many years that this is one of the type of global challenges we will continue to face. Even as we get over this, hopefully in a few months uh, by next year, we will continue to be struggling with pandemic diseases. Uh, it is uh, it is inevitable. Uh, and just the movement of people of goods. Uh, and uh, uh, and so how we handle this is going to have uh, implications for how we handle future ones. At the end of the day, like so many things in, in global politics, you need cooperation and coordination. Uh, interestingly, the Europeans who have a long history of that, in general, they're they're you know they're co coordinating more carefully. But even there, we're seeing heightened tensions and and maybe a, a certain nativism. You know, countries kind of perking down to take care of themselves first. And so it is. A, it is a time of uh, it's breaking uh, down. It's breaking yeah. down. Yes. And, and our foreign policy is uh, declining and getting so fragmented. I mean. I read this morning that the United States, that uh, the Department of Justice had indicted Maduro uh, yes, in absentia, yes. which is, yes, I mean, that's that's, right. that's not really the greatest, uh, you know, foreign policy you could have. He is running the country de facto. So indicting him doesn't sound like it's a positive move at all. But I want to ask you one last question. We haven't talked about this in minutes. This, you know, early on, we heard a lot from the World Health Organization. They were dragging their heels on declaring a pandemic, but we did, you know, everybody was asking them, what do you think, what do you think? And, and they were dragging their heels, and I'm not sure what they're doing now. I think it's, it's almost like they're off the stage. Um, so we talk about the decline, the hardening of the borders. We talk about the decline of foreign foreign relations. Um, and, in the, and the question that comes to mind is, what about the United Nations? The United Nations was, you know, created to be a facilitator, uh, to connect people up, connect countries up, and to avoid this kind of decline. Is the United Nations up to the job? Is it doing the job? What else can the United Nations do in a time where uh, relationships between countries, international rela relationships, for all these factors we've talked about are declining? Well, where is the United Nations these days? Well, here, just to clarify, the World Health Organization is an, uh, is an entity, a part of the umbrella of the UN. It's an autonomous, independent agency based in Geneva, Switzerland, but it is part of the UN uh, family. Uh, and they are, of course, the lead agency for this. They, they bring together. And something we have to understand, I think often there's a misperception of the UN as if it was somehow world government or as if it had like even a you know, rapid reaction force or military force. Uh, the UN is really a, a collection of countries, 190 from some that come together. But in the end, it, it does more equation and, and maybe it, it only is as good as the, the, the members who, who are going to contribute to it. So here again, the World Health Organization is a group of experts in, in medicine and, and, and you know disease and whatnot. But ultimately what they're doing is they're simply coordinating with the respective public health ministries of countries. Uh, and, and there is a role. It is it is happening. And, and uh, you know, I think it's it's probably more relevant for smaller and medium sized countries. For the United States, we have a long history of skepticism and even disdain and of course uh, under president trump today uh, a very strong anti uh, un sentiment uh, anti multilateralism uh, but again i want to just say that the un doesn't have it's often criticized it just doesn't have enough teeth or capacity to enforce things uh, so if nations don't want to cooperate and sometimes the us chooses not to uh, it's not going to have a capacity to do anything about it uh, but uh, I would tell you on uh, something like what we see now, this pandemic crisis uh, that we're experiencing, uh, the, the World Health Organization does have considerable credibility and legitimacy, and, and it is playing a role. It is not managing the crisis because that has to be done at the at the individual state level. Uh, and even there, you know, states, countries manage their own affairs, but you have a variation like the United States. Uh, our federal system, even in Germany, would be a good example. The, the chancellor of Germany, Angela Merkel, she doesn't have the power to enforce, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, nationwide policies. Germany has a lot of, in its federal system, a lot of power given to the individual uh, states themselves. So she can only do so much as well. Uh, in the U.S., is, is the same situation. What you have in the absence, maybe, or the weakness of the leadership of President Trump, you have the governors of California, New York, and other places stepping up to fill some of that void. And I think same with the UN. The UN doesn't have a capacity to force a solution. Uh, states have to step up and do it. 
However, I think for small states, for those that are maybe with less capacity, the UN becomes maybe a very powerful, uh, you know, support network. Uh, but uh, I would just say again, their main role is coordinating, you know, providing information, expertise. Uh, but ultimately, we have a world today where these virtual communities, again, doctors and, and, and scientists who, who understand this, they have these networks all around the world that are connected and plugged in and using Zoom and, and these, you know, uh, information technologies like we have here uh, to stay uh, uh, informed. Uh, and they share information uh, and they provide expertise. Uh, but we all, you know, we have to, I think, understand the UN is not world government. It doesn't have the capacity or the authority of governments to do what, what uh, you know, what any government That's might right. be able to do. But things are changing so fast, Carlos. Uh, you know, next time we meet, uh, hopefully a couple of weeks, um, I think we'll have a whole different conversation about a lot of these issues. Uh, it's worth watching in, in a time of transformation. I, I used to say transition, but it's really transformation because when we come out the other side, you know, the, the study of international relations will be different. The study of foreign policy and diplomatic relations will be different. And I want to follow that with you. Carlos this is Juarez. A good changer. Yeah. Thank you, Jay, and aloha. Aloha. And we will